Well, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to have a chance to talk to Roy Wagner. Um, Roy, when and where were you born? I was born in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, October 2nd, 1938, the birthday of the Mahatma Gandhi, Wallace Stevens. Can you speak very loudly? <laughs> the uh, birthday of the Mahatma Gandhi, yeah. Wallace Stevens, and Groucho Marx. <laughs> Which of them do you take after, I wonder? I hope. Wallace Stevens, although Gandhi has good possibilities. So. <laughs> Lovely. Um, some people like to go back to at least their grandparents, uh, certainly their parents. Can you tell, tell me something about your ancestry? My ancestry was uh, originated, we are told, in Hamlin, mm. in Lower Saxony, responded to the call of Bela IV of Hungary to repopulate lands depleted by the Mongols. And so they were uh, metal workers living in eastern Carpathians under Hungarian rule until my great-grandfather came to the United States. All of my ancestors, okay? <laughs> All your ancestors, right, on both sides? Yes. Yeah, and then at what stage did they leave? Uh, the people from their community came to Cleveland, Ohio, where I was born. At what time did they come? Uh, my great-grandfather came over in uh, uh, 1890. Hmm. This was a high point of immigration into the United States from Eastern Europe. Hmm. What was their occupation on the whole? Uh, their occupation was uh, metalworking of hmm. one kind or another. It said that uh, my great-grandfather had owned a water-powered uh, iron forge. Hmm. And then, uh, what about your parents? My father was the chief of police of Cleveland, Ohio. Hmm. Uh, and a very tough guy. <laughs> He's also an intellectual. Was he? Yeah. He Which is very unusual. Hmm. I mean, what sort of character, apart from being tough, was he? His profile, he looked just like uh, Dick Tracy, the American comic strip uh, <laughs> hero. and. Most of his, for most of his career, he was the chief of the detective bureau, so mm. he, that's what an intellectual cop does. Do mm. mm. you think being, having a father as an intellectual cop had um, any influence on your... I'm sure it did. Uh, actually, I, I, I don't think my father cared particularly much for anthropology. Uh, mm. My mother liked it and mm. encouraged me. She mm. would buy me uh, Kroeber textbooks and stuff like that. At was. what age? Pardon? Well, at what age did she buy when you? When I was in my teens. Oh, she yeah. liked to buy me poetry and, uh, and things like that, I think. Uh, hmm. She had sort of different idea about things than, than my father. She liked anthropology very much. She didn't hmm. like it very much at all. Hmm. What, did she have a, a job? or No, no. She was, uh, you know, uh, the, what we call a housewife, the kind of woman that uh, hmm. existed in America. <laughs> Still exists in small pockets around the world. Yeah, okay. um, but what was her personality apart from encouraging you? Uh, she was very, very withdrawn and quiet. Mm. Uh, I often think of her as being like Kali. A colleague? Kali, Kali, Kali Ma, the Shakti goddess. Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, you, you didn't want to cross her, but she was very withdrawn. Mm. Uh, very interesting person, actually. Mm. She died young. She died at 52. Mm. Did you have brothers and sisters? One sister who mm. is uh, a very uh, accomplished... She's not a professional Egyptologist. She writes novels about, say, the 17th dynasty of ancient mm. Egypt. Very good novels. She's a much better writer than I am. Mm. What, what is... What name does she write under? Uh, Nancy Elliott, uh, that's her married name. Mm -hmm. When did you, and where did you first go to school? Well, uh, to college. Mm. Uh, I went to... Well, no, not college, school. Oh, uh, just... Uh, primary school. Or my, oh, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, mm. Benjamin Franklin Elementary School. Mm. And then I went to James Floyd Rhodes High School in mm. Cleveland. Mm. And then I went to... Harvard. Well, look, look, not too fast. Okay. You, um, I thought you were going to get me to speed you on, but in fact I'm going to slow you down. Okay. Um, because the, the early education is 
often quite interesting. Uh, do you remember anything about your primary school? Not much about my primary school except for something that happened when I was 10 years old and I still haven't figured it out. Um, we had a garden in, in Benjamin Franklin's school and we were taught to garden. One of the best things about my education, in fact, because when I became an adult, I lived in the country and did a great deal. I just had a big garden every year and I was taught that. Uh, basic Neolithic skill. One day in the spring, when I was waiting outside of the garden in a queue of students, we were told to be quiet, otherwise they would do something horrible. They, they intimidated us like that. Um, this idea occurred to me, and I still, at the time I was totally mystified. I don't know where it came from. It, I still don't know where it came from. The idea was that of all the possible things, the many possible things that could happen at the next moment, only one of them would. And I don't know why the idea occurred to me in that way. I was not used to thinking things of that sort. Uh, it puzzled me for a long time. It, uh, uh, later on I got to thinking that way a little bit, but uh, I don't know where that came from. Otherwise, my, uh, my record in uh, uh, elementary school and things like that was extremely mediocre. Uh, I, I didn't really do anything much until I got to high school. And that was very splendid. And uh, I discovered sonnets. Science. Sonnets. 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 I love to write I'm very sonnets. deaf, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm fine. Uh, I love to write sonnets, and so I started uh, trying to write sonnets. They were, of course, horrible at that point. But, uh, and then I wanted to be a physicist. The thing I wanted to be most of all was a physicist. And uh, I took these uh, SAT tests that you take in the United States to qualify for, for college. For, and um, I'd always gotten terrible grades in math. And I took the verbal and the mathematics achievement tests. And uh, I was done well in verbal tests and poorly. And something happened. I don't know what happened. And uh, on a whim, I had applied to Caltech, the California Institute of Technology, because they ran the Mount Palomar Observatory. And I thought mm. that might be a nice place to be. I wanted to be an astronomer. And uh, uh, a faculty member from Caltech showed up one day at my high school, and he said he came to interview. And uh, I was dumbfounded. It turns out I did fairly well on the math test in spite of myself. <laughs> so I had a long interview with this gentleman. And um, the whole time we talked about sonnets. I was just talking to him about sonnets, uh, theory of the sonnet, and things like that. And he sort of said something. He said, you know, uh, wasn't it uh, astronomy you were interested <laughs> in or something like that? Uh, and I said, well, yeah, and, uh, and he said, well, that's all right. You see, I'm from the English department at, at Caltech, <laughs> <coughs> so my greatest, I did not get into mm -hmm. Caltech, but um, my greatest sort of source of pride at that time was almost getting into Caltech. <laughs> I, uh, very, very strange, uh, skewed set of values. Later on in my life, I discovered that it was rather fun to write sonnets. I write lots of them now. Mm. I, I enjoy writing them. Mm. I like poetry a great deal. Mm. And, and is poetry, reading poetry also yes, important yes, to you? Yes, yes, yes. That's so right. which poets are? Um, I, I was very keen on Dylan Thomas mm. uh, at first, and especially when I was in high school in Rilke. I, I became like a total, Yeats, mm. became a total Rilke nut. Mm. I used to translate Rilke for Vic Turner, as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, who really liked it. Vic Turner said that, that uh, he liked Rilke so much he was going to give up on Yeats and all the Celtic poets. He said Rilke was just it's clearly superior. <laughs> and Rilke is really good. Mm. Chinese poets sometimes, uh, haiku, mm. I got to like some of the haiku writers mm. and things like that. But, mm. Now, all these, uh, well, the haiku and so on are earlier, but the Poets you mentioned are mainly 20th or 19th. 
Uh, uh, Shelley and Keats, especially hmm. Keats. I also like Goethe. I, uh, I was told by the Harvard Astronomy Department to take German. <laughs> And so I, I took actually quite a bit of German because I noticed it helped me to uh, it helped me to uh, uh, read Rilke, mm. and uh, I actually took a course, a wonderful course in Chaucer, in which the instructor, a very famous man named Bartlett Whiting, mm. an expert on humor in Chaucer, he gave the course in a medieval fashion. He um, simply read the text. He read, say, the Canterbury Tales or the House of Fame or one of these Chaucer things. He would, he would just read the, uh, read the textual material and comment, mm -hmm. you know, like a professor at the University of Paris or something in the Middle Ages. The result was we could understand and speak Middle English. <laughs> and that was cool. I mm -hmm. thought that was, that was like, totally neat. Lovely. Let, let's go back to the school. Were there any teachers at your high school, anyway, who particularly influenced you? Yes, there was. We had uh, Hiram T. Folkman, the incredible Shakespeare teacher. I mean, this this guy. Well, how do you spell his name? F O L K M A N. Yeah. Uh, Folkman, and uh, a math and science teacher named Oliver Hoffman. Hmm. These two people were more or less guiding spirits to me. They were in some ways opposite people. They were amazing teachers. Mm. Um, Folkman took elaborate pains. He would make you get up and interpret things in, in Shakespeare. He would make, make you explain what, they, what, what was being said. I think that uh, this exercise in, in high school prepared me for, you know, the art of explanation in anthropology. I mean, I'm not talking about theory. Mm. I'm talking about explanation. Mm. I think explanation is much more important. Don Juan in, in Castaneda says that an explanation is always an apology. It's always a form of apology. Very well, I suppose it is. It's an apology for not knowing immediately what you're talking about, that you have to detour, mm. right? Make some detours and explain. Mm. On the other hand, it's the best way of thinking about anthropology. I, I, I think that a lot of the things we would like to uh, conquer with um, abstractions in anthropology are actually concrete. They're too concrete to actually stand the abstractions of theory, right? So, uh, we, want, we want a kind of concretivity, a concrete experience, pragmatic concrete experience with things. Okay? This is, is an object science. Mm. Okay? You, you're, you remind me of it. Mm. Um, and uh, so rather than, uh, and the explanations can be any kind of explanations as long as you communicate this, you see, to the audience. So I prefer to lecture extempore hmm. and just be guided by, by that kind of thing. Now that I think of it, and I've never thought of it this way before, I was prepared for this by my Shakespeare teacher, by, by Hiram Folkman, hmm. very strange man. What about the physics teacher? Uh, the, Maths. He, uh, uh, well, this was at the time uh, the United States was going through a great deal of difficulty with Oppenheimer and uh, you know the the removal of the security clearance. In fact, I'll tell you the story. I was very much an Oppenheimer fan, mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, later on, got very interested in the case of Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was a, a verbal genius. He was a, a, a charismatic figure and very gifted in the use of words. I was told that he had in mind as an alternative career going into literature. It just he he happened to have matured at the time that uh, you know uh, quantum physics was big stuff in Germany. He went to Germany, went to Scotland, went to England, uh, possibly even here, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, and 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 you know did his graduate work in in, in physics. Um, it's not that original, but he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, many years later, around 1990, 
I was sitting in my office at Virginia, and the phone rang, and someone had, was calling from uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, this man explained that he was had taken up uh, deep sea diving after retirement and uh, was planning to do some diving in the islands north of New Guinea, and could I advise him on, you know, travel to New Guinea and things like this, which... Uh, which I did, and um, he thanked me, and he said, uh, thank you, my name is Louis Strauss. I'm just another faceless Washingtonian. Louis? Uh, Strauss. Strauss. This was the head of the Atomic Energy Committee that was responsible for removing Oppenheimer's security clearance. He was, I suppose, the ultimate enemy of my youth. <laughs> and then, much later, this guy calls me up and describes himself as another faceless Washingtonian. <laughs> what this means, I found out, was that after Strauss, Louis Strauss had, uh, uh, by very devious means, in fact, using very nasty strategy, he, he hated Oppenheimer, hmm. uh, managed to engineer this, this coup against Oppenheimer. Which basically destroyed Oppenheimer's life. You move your hands down a bit. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> After he had engineered this coup against Oppenheimer, um, he never held another government office. Mm. Uh, Oppenheimer had too many friends. Mm. Okay. He just did something too nasty. But I, that, this is this is a kind of a you know echo or something like that for me. I, I just thought it was unusual mm. that mm. that should have happened. <laughs> so. The, other, the only other thing to ask about school, well, a, a couple of things. One is, did you have any sort of, apart from sonnets, any external hobbies, music, games? Uh, music, I, uh, my roommate was an orchestral conductor and an extremely good one. All I had to do was hang around our suite. Hmm. And uh, music critics, instrumentalists, experts on particular composers would come by and just have long chats with my roommate and I. I learned more about classics. This is at high school? At, at Harvard. I'm talking ah, about Harvard. yes, you see. I just skipped across ahead. English school means um, before university. Yes, and I think rightly so. And my son insists that that's where he got his main education, too. And we sent him to a, a very nice progressive mm. school outside yeah. of Charlottesville mm. called Tenda. Mm. Uh, and I, I quite agree with you, and I think it, it matters also for me, and I, I am pleased with your emphasis on that. I'm sorry. But, so, at, at high school, yes. um, did you have any other particular interests, sport or not, music? Not that, uh, not that I'm aware of. I, uh, I think I was supposed to be discovering women, and I was slow at it. <laughs> I think this got on the nerves. Was it co-educational? Yes, it was co-educational. It was not a private school, as we say in the States. It was said to be the best public high school, in our sense, in the Cleveland area, and probably was. But uh, Cleveland was a very working class. Uh, it was famous for its steel mills, right? So it's a, a uh, it was a pe peculiar environment. I loved it. It was a great time. It was a great time to be alive. You mm. know, I, I really have really good memories. Mm. This is the, must be the 50s, is it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly the, the, the Fonz era, the era when um, rock and roll music, which I did not care for, uh, mm. you know, came into being and things like that. Uh, mm. the, the, the height of the Cold War. Uh, the degree to which we Americans were being shut up, repressed, forced to mouth patriotic slogans was probably counterparted by the Soviet Union at that time. We always thought of ourselves as being free at that time, but we were not. We were under this heavy, in you know, doctrinaire constraint from, from the government. We were a free country. We this is not the McCarthy like era, isn't it? We were free people. <laughs> This is McCarthy era, isn't it? Yes, uh, and I did watch the McCarthy hearings on TV regularly. Uh, at school, at high school? After school, school after mm -hmm. school. Yeah. I just come home and there would be uh, McCarthy uh, doing his outrageous stuff and his lawyers. Did, it, did you feel it was outrageous at the time? Yes. Mm. 
I didn't like it, but I also felt that he was getting away with something. And I think that a lot of Americans responded to him this way. They thought, you know, here's, you know, this guy is, uh, is, is, is a real jackass, but, uh, but look, look what he's getting away with. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's doing these power plays. And then finally, you know, everybody got sick of this. And uh, the president, not one of my favorite people, Eisenhower, hmm. uh, just, you know, came down on him, shut him up. Hmm. Uh, I think Einstein responded uh, when they were uh, punishing Oppenheimer for hmm. very, very similar things. And, uh, and this is the Red Scare and uh, the McCarthy period. Uh, we didn't like it. Hmm. I was not minded in that direction. I suppose I was a liberal or something. Hmm. Well, that leads on to a sort of your politics either there or later on. Um, I, I'm an anarchist, I do. Uh, an anarchist? <laughs> uh, I th yeah, I, I, I really, I don't think the political fora that we have uh, for opinion and things like that are engage the major issues of our time. Uh, I'm not happy with them. I don't, uh, mm. I don't vote. Mm. Okay. You haven't ever at all? No, I voted for John F. Kennedy uh, mm. and uh, then he was shot, and uh, after that I didn't want to vote. Hmm. Right, let's go on. I mean, you were very proud of being uh, turned down or half accepted for Caltech, but g going to Harvard seems even better. But yeah, well, not to me at the time. I went around in gloom. <laughs> People congratulated me, but mm. I went around in gloom. Hmm. Why was that? Because I didn't get accepted into Caltech. I see. But what about Harvard? How, how was that? What did you go to do? I Harvard? went there to uh, be an astronomer, and uh, that's why I took German. And uh, it, through some uh, stroke of luck, the uh, astronomy department uh, assigned me, uh, well, uh, assigned a pioneer in astronomy, a woman pioneer in astronomy, Cecilia Pena Pushkin, to be my tutor. Hmm. Um, and so for a while, for about a year, I was uh, working toward, bec you know, being an astronomy major. And uh, uh, when uh, she loved poetry and music, so that when I had a tutorial session with Cecilia Payne-Gaposchkin, we talked about Mozart, or we talked about poetry, so hmm. we talked about... Uh, uh, there must be a lot of things like this in life. Much later in my life, when I became, when I got divorced, I I hired, I, I engaged a, a famously vicious and beautiful divorce lawyer in the Charlottesville area. Okay, really famous for her vehemence and charm, mm. and her, her, she was voted the best dressed woman in Charlottesville when she drove drove this white Porsche. Mm. Um, she never. We never talked about law at all. We it, we law had nothing to do. We would talk about cats and dogs. That's the only thing. She would hold up her lovebirds for me to kiss. <laughs> That's there. There. There must be a whole lot of contextual things like this, like like my talks with Cecilia Pena Pushkin, where people simply talk about what they like to talk about and. Uh, it has nothing to do with why they're supposed to be there. Hmm. I've noticed this quite a bit. <laughs> There's a, you know, like sonnets and, uh, hmm. and, and physics or you know, things like mm -hmm. that. Did you see any, some people see some structural, a deep structural affinity between music and mathematics and things like this? Do you uh, see I'm, I'm quite interested in those things. I do from time to time write things about uh, the history of music. Hmm. I, one of the most, the, the one of the biggest um, watershed events, I think, in Western music was the, the harmonization techniques of J.S. Bach, where he correlated the melodic or horizontal line with the harmonic or vertical line, and he was doing simultaneous stuff in both. That, uh, that closes upon holography, which is a major interest of mine, holography and fractal mathematics. Mm. which uh, we've seen in recent years. We've had uh, 
a lot of successes with identifying what I call holographic worldviews in the beginning. I'm, my, my colleague Fred Damon does this sort of thing too with, with fractal mathematics. And I'm very excited about this and I sometimes write things or am writing things connecting those kind of advances with the mathematical advances in music. I have a private theory. Um, I sort of took up the cudgels for Johann Christian Bach uh, a few years ago, the uh, youngest son of Sebastian Bach, and apparently the favored son of Sebastian Bach, who was called the London Bach, hmm. and who was a court composer for Queen Charlotte. This is the George III hmm. era. Uh, and who was the most famous composer of his day, and we have lately learned the teacher of Mozart, who taught Mozart how to write music the Mozart way. What I think the secret of Christian Bach's music is, is syncopation. I think by the use of syncopation, he speeded up, he gave music the... Uh, the sense of increased speed or acceleration. Uh, usually this is, it's called the new music. It's the way that uh, in London and in Mannheim, Germany in about 1750, music suddenly changed and became the classical music of the Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, uh, and subsequent era. I believe that the, the, the watershed event there was syncopation. You know, this is a theory. Hmm. I don't know who would agree with me, but uh, and I'm interested in that, in a sense, mathematically, or I'm interested in that uh, as a combination of uh, mathematics and uh, aesthetics. And I see that as sort of one of the major architectonic uh, tropes, you might say, in the development of Western culture. Okay, uh, uh, developing a particularly I would say maybe a transcendental, a resonant music, tactile, sonority sense, as opposed to the visual. Uh, one might notice that most of what passes as scientific knowledge is visual and very strictly dependent, you know, like the periodic table or God help us the Bohr atom or uh, a, a lot of the, a lot of the, not all of the quantum stuff, some of the quantum stuff is tactile, Re residential, okay, and, and in that sense, I think maybe a cut above the visual. Uh, science has been enslaved by the visual for a long time, even structuralism, for instance. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of uh, explanation stuff that I would attach to that, to, 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 to this stuff. Anyway, uh, it'll give you a sense, I don't know, I think what's interesting here is that possibly um, uh, interesting in sound, uh, mathematical resonance and things like this has for some reason played, maybe that's connected with sonnets too, I don't know. Hmm. It's played a big role, I suppose, in my theoretical development. What about Handel? Uh, I love the water music and I love the royal fireworks music hmm. more. The Messiah is, of course, brilliant and great. Handel is very often, of course, contrasted with Bach. Hmm. I suppose I prefer Bach, but preference doesn't mean very much in this. It's like you have to take a choice between two very good things, and I refuse to do so. I love the B minor mass. I love uh, many things from Bach. I don't like uh, Bach nearly so much as Johann Christian Bach. I really like Johann Christian Bach. <laughs> and I would like to... Well, actually, this is quite interesting, because... Um, the revival, Christian Bach had to wait until the CD for a revival. And the revival was mostly done by English conductors. Hmm. English conductors do Christian Bach superbly well. Hmm. It's like that's English music. Hmm. They do it far better than the Germans. The Germans cannot do uh, Christian Bach without making it sound a little sour, like, you know, they wish it was Wagner, but it's not, <laughs> or something like that. The British stuff is, uh, I'm trying to recall the names of these conductors, but they're mm. tremendously good. The, uh, the early music people. Um, uh, well, some of them, uh, who, who are these people, you know, the St. Martin's in the field? Yes. Uh, 
Oh, there's Christopher two. Hogwood. Uh, yes, 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 yes. And, and Most of them were at Cambridge. It, oh, is that so? Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's quite possible that the that the uh, Christian Bach revival was done at Cambridge, as a matter of fact. Mm. This has convinced me of a number of things. One of them is that uh, London has played a much greater role in music, in Western music, than most people think. Mm. And uh, it's a, a role that contrasts with Vienna. Mm. Uh, the successful Viennese uh, composers came to London, like, like uh, Haydn. Mm. Unfortunately, no, Mozart never made it. Mm. Uh, Beethoven was subsidized mm. from London, mm. as you may know. Um, but uh, Christian Bach worked here, and he was a great friend of Gainsborough. And mm. they would, um, they would um, do concerts uh, by showing Gainsborough's landscapes, which was the, which was the uh, art form that Gains Gainsborough preferred. Mm. They would backlight Gainsborough landscapes and then play Christian Bach's music. Mm. Christian Bach's music has been called more Mozartian than Mozart, and very often it is. It's, mm. Sometimes it's better than Mozart. Mm. It's really very, very good music. It's only only uh, other ones, the, the, the other initiators of the new music were the Mannheim School, people like uh, Johann and Karl Stamitz. Mm. And a guy named Kanebich, who's also mm. very good, a German uh, composer named Kanebich. Uh, the Germans don't even do those as well as the English either, so you, you have the idea that there was a, a kind of trope developing in music there, possibly correl correlative with the sensibility writers like Keats and Shelley later in, mm. in, in England and so on. Let's come back to Harvard again. Yes. Um, there must be an did you go on with astronomy for the three years? Uh, no, uh, I, I quit it after one year and experimented with various things. I think I was an English uh, literature major for one, one semester or, and uh, then I went into history and I, I did my degree in, I was with honors, a uh, cum, in medieval history, which of course uh, makes uh, Cambridge, a wonderful place to work mm. around in. Mm. Uh, but uh, I, I did a medieval history, and then in my fourth year, in my senior year at Harvard, I met a uh, gentleman, uh, Eugene Anderson. Uh, later. Can you say the, the name? Eugene Anderson. Yeah. Uh, I met him in a poetry composition course. As yeah. He was a very good poet. Mm. Uh, and he was an anthrop uh, anthropology major, and he more or less steered me in that direction, or at least I had uh, I had some very important conversations with him. And he said, basically, historians and anthropologists think very differently, radically differently, almost opposite to one another. And I thought that sounded like a very good thing, because I was not much impressed with the way historians were thinking. In fact, I'd made up my mind that historians can't <laughs> and I still think that historians can't think. I mean, there are great historians. Some of my best friends are historians, mm. as they say. But so, what do you mean by they can't think? Well, uh, they they in in uh, their uh, extreme uh, interest in sequentiality and uh, you know one thing after another. Basically, they miss the paradigmatic factors. They miss the cross cutting factors or synchronic factors, so beautifully evidenced in music, for instance. Hmm. All right? Anthropologists don't seem to have a problem like that. If anything, anthropologists are like the Mayans and the Hindus who believe in inverse things and everything happening at once. Or at least they seem to be able to do that better, and I prefer that. I think that anthropology gives one the, uh, the other reference, the other set of references that history doesn't provide. And since history is basically doctrinaire, ideological, etc., etc., um, and and totally identified with you know with with political currents and things like that in in our civilization, uh, I think it's it's time we had some relief from that. Uh, uh, that's why I, I like anthropology very much and uh, uh, take it very seriously intellectually, even though. Most of us, most of us anthropologists, uh, I mean, we're so scattered. 
we're, we're so fragmented with our different areas of expertise. You know, it's like a collection of disparate objects, isn't it? Uh, <coughs> cabinet of curiosities. <laughs> a cabinet, uh, yeah. With the, we have a, a graduate student in archaeology. That's, there's a term the Dutch used to use for a, a cabinet of curiosities, a kulturkammer or something like that. But she uh, she sort of accused some of these Vermeer interiors, you see, of, of being these uh, kultur, sort of the, the intellectual equivalent of a of a kulturkammer, hmm. uh, a, a little niche of uh, you know the world's uh, wonders and things all put uh, juxtaposed together like that. That's basically a good thing. It's um, it's one of the virtues I think of of our uh, of our profession. But you see, what People wonder where anthropology is going, don't they? They do. You know. They have forever. <laughs> uh, of course, and uh, we uh, are no help. I mean, we uh, we certainly uh, aggravate that potential. Um, and yet, if you look at Chinese civilization, for instance, there was this period after the unification of China when they instituted the civil service system, right? And by <coughs> dint of something, possibly burning books and burying scholars alive, I don't know, they, they managed to uh, set up a situation where they abolished disciplines. There were no more disciplines. There was basically Chinese literature or whatever, I don't know what you could, the classics, mm -hmm. the Confucian classics, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, you had the three exams, right? Uh, the three degrees mm -hmm. of expertise, the last one graded by the emperor, you could be a provincial government, you governor, you could be a general, you could be a mandarin, uh, based on uh, your skill and cleverness at interpreting the classics. That was a unification, uh, an abolishment of disciplinary boundaries. I like to think sometimes that we're tending towards something like that, that in perhaps 50 years or so, or 100 years, there won't be these differentia between professions, that we will have some kind of generalist. Now, it occurs to me that the only kind of generalist that makes any sense in this context is an anthropologist. But how are we going to unify the discipline with the, with the degree of fragmentation? You can see, you know, you can go to the, the largest convocation of anthropologists in the world is the American AAA conventions, mm -hmm. okay, which are uh, unbelievably chaotic. Uh, you go into one of these huge hotel lobbies like in the Washington Hilton or something like that. There are 5,000 anthropologists and they're all having their separate highly motivated uh, entranced conversations and nobody loves to hear themselves talk about it. Just look at me. I'm worse than my father, and my father was, was unbelievable this way. And he, people listened to him because he told police stories, <laughs> right? I mean, I just tell, like, you know, New Guinea stories and stuff like that. And so people are disinclined, and they say, Roy, why don't you take a vacation? You know, right, why, why don't you go on a cruise ship or something like that? <laughs> um, but, uh, and so these guys love to hear themselves talk, right? And you've got this, this immense room full of them, and... Uh, um, so you open the door to the Hilton lobby. <laughs> you know how are you going to get unity out of that? You'll never get unity out of that. This is this is this is some kind of a diffractional uh, heat death thing for the universe, and everything's going off in its own direction, right? Hmm. Uh, I'd like to think it would it would I would love to think this would be it'd be really so wonderful to think that it says so one of these brilliant young geniuses like Tony Crook. You know, in England, Tony Crook. Hmm. Uh, see, if they could discover some way of bringing order into this, bringing unity into this chaos of cultural insights, explanations, tropes, directions, hmm. and things like that, that would be great. I'm saying that because Tony did something wonderful for our work in Papua New Guinea. Unbeknownst, to many people, there is a multi-ethnic religion in the center of New Guinea. There has been in what are called the Star Mountains or the Mountain Up region. There is an institutionalized religion. 
that has persisted over about 400 years at a place called the Telefolip. It has its own buildings. They rebuild these buildings generation after generation. I had the chance to interview some of the elders a few years ago. Uh, the ideology of this religion, it's the Afek religion. It's based on the creatress Afek. And her nemesis, Magalim, who is the end of the world, his binima, entropy. And it's, the world is seen as more as a, a, a contest between these two. The many say it's very interesting. They, they, use, they have a series of initiatory uh, seclusions. And they use Schrodinger's cat. They use the idea that, uh, from, from quantum theory, this idea of, you know, whether the cat is dead or alive, the Schrodinger's cat mm, yes, yes. That's one of the tropes they use in, uh, in initiating these kids. I mean, uh, they want to elicit answers like, we cannot know. We cannot know the answer to that because it depends on how you ask the question. <laughs> this, is, these are, these are, this is this religion. It's, it's like somewhere between Buddhism somewhere between Buddhism and oh, uh, quantum theory, something like that. It's, very, it's an intellectual discipline that's indigenous to New Guinea and existed without the existence of a centralized state. It was, however, centralized hmm. as a religion. Tony, uh, Tony Crook, in his book on the subject, calls it uh, the graveyard of anthropological careers. I've had students uh, who one of them wrote, I thought, one of the best studies of Mountain Oak people. Nobody knows where she is now. She disappeared. I, I can't account for it. And uh, three, four, five, six others who just left anthropology after working there. This is a case of competition between the anthropologist and the indigenous folk. And the indigenous folk win. And the anthropologist loses. Frederick Barth was a very, very brave man and a man I admire very much. Frederick Barth published the first and for a long time the only book on the mountain. And uh, he's, he had the sentence in it, uh, the amazing thing is the absence of shared assumptions between people in intimate interaction. That lust in his job his wife divorced him. He was almost institutionalized, I was told. When you say that lost him, you mean... That sentence. Really? In Norway. People take things very seriously in Norway. Uh, these are Vikings, after all. <laughs> and uh, Frederick is my hero. He's, I think, one of the greatest men in anthropology. Because he had the guts. If he had the conviction, he had the guts to publish that sentence. He, of course, he got another job, a very good one, of course. He's still a leader in Norwegian anthropology, okay? My point is that afterward, Tony Crook found a solution to the Mount Nock thing. He said in his thesis, uh, these people have developed an art of changing the subject in mid-sentence. They've developed a rhetoric that if they use it, they can convince you that the society is full of secrets and no one will ever find out what those secrets are. But it has nothing to do with it. The secrets don't exist. This is their way of talking. They have this finessed rhetoric that drives the anthropologist crazy. Okay, so what I'm telling you is that, uh, well, someone from Cambridge, a student of Marilyn Strathern, hmm solved what was the biggest problem in New Guinea studies, solved uh, with that uh, what was the biggest prob intellectual problem in anthropology. So what I'm saying is that there's hope. <laughs> there's hope that maybe anthropology will someday uh, be able to um, achieve some kind of um, unifying synthesis. Because if this culture is ever to have something like what the Chinese got, the abolition of disciplinary boundaries, one could not do it with anything less general than anthropology. It would have to be anthropology. Now, I, I see a lot of, uh, say, Edmund Leach, Sir Edmund Leach's work 
mm. in this direction. I see a lot of uh, Marilyn Strathairn's work is going in this direction. Uh, it would presage a great uh, future for anthropology, and yet I don't see it as coming very soon. Mm. But I think it would be the destiny of our discipline. Something that started with, with Sir James Fraser, something that started with E.B. Tyler, something that started with Lewis Henry Morgan in the United States. We invented kinship. You people invented culture with E.B. E. B. Tyler. Edward Burnett Tyler invented mm -hmm. culture. Lewis Henry Morgan invented kinship in Rochester, New York. From then on, the British did kinship. <laughs> and the Americans did culture. It's, it's, it's why, why do you think that? Why, I don't, why did some that law of inversions. Some law of inversions. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure why that happened, but it's terribly ironic. It's one of these big ironies, you see. Everybody talks, sometimes in England, with, you know, with, with tremendous irony about, about an American cultural anthropologist. Now, what could this be? You know, why is culture such a mystery to these Americans? Why are they always thinking it has patterns and things like that? And then, then we Americans, we look at, at the British and we say, well, you know, society, yes, they have this great place value society, you know, this, this, this social place is the only thing they ever think about. So, of course, they're going to do kinship and social place. Uh, it, that's what Americans often, this is our counter accusation after the culture thing. Uh, they're both talking about the same thing. Each, each, each side is you know, using up its biases against the other, so to speak. It's... It's, it's really quite interesting. Hmm. You mentioned a couple of people there who would be nice to, at least one of them, um, say a little bit more about as as we go through and you mentioned names. Yes. Someone who is very close to your work in many ways is Marilyn Strathairn. Yes, indeed. Tell me what something more about your relations with Marilyn. Well, actually, Marilyn and uh, her former husband, Andrew, hmm. uh, it was interesting, when I first went into the field uh, in, in, in New Guinea um, in 1963, uh, it was very lonely. Not many people had worked in the New Guinea Highlands, and uh, I had bought myself a shortwave radio, and I was listening to it one evening in, in, in the village, and uh, they had announced the arrival from uh, Cambridge of Andrew and Marilyn at Mount Hagen to work with the Hagen people. It was very successful. One of the one of the best uh, research experiences, uh, you know. In uh, Marilyn and Andrew wrote uh, very varied. Say they wrote about body decoration, which no one had written about uh, until that time. I mean, they would tackle really interesting and far out topics. So I felt very good when I heard that on the radio. I thought someone is here. You know, someone serious is here doing doing studies in the Highlands. Later, I. Um, Lost by well, I, I, their statistics came out as to the you know temporal distribution so to speak of, of workers in the Highlands and I was able to plot a bell curve that peaked in 1972 of workers uh, pe people doing field work in New Guinea especially the Highlands it turns out that this was the great time of Melanesian work and the Melanesian work cast this huge spell, this kind of influence over anthropology. I think it's still going on today, although it's, it's diminishing. Uh, to some degree also work in Indonesia and Madagascar peaked hmm. at about that time. And that was the great uh, fueler of, uh, you know, concrete material, concrete data for thinking. Um, I think that uh, Marilyn's work took the lead partly because she was very attentive to gender issues and that, that became, uh, I'm not talking about feminism, although she does mention that, but gender, the treatment of gender in anthropology, I think that she was a, 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 you know, a kind of a landmark figure in that. And uh, I've always honored her for that. I do gender a little bit differently when I when, when I handle it, but uh, I've always admired her. And then this thing about holography, mm -hmm. uh, fractal mathematics, she was also a pioneer in that. As a matter of fact, when I wrote my first thing uh, called The Fractal Person, 
it was actually under the influence of Marilyn's work and uh, in a volume edited by Godelier on, on, on great men. Uh, and I you know, mentioned particularly that this, this, this study was derivative of Marilyn's work. So I think that Marilyn was, uh, and to some degree perhaps the work of Marshall Solons too in the United States, I think that her work was, um, you know, diagnostic, emblematic, perhaps, of the kind of theoretical insights that came out of that, uh, that sort of uh, investment of research time and uh, aerial investment in Melanesia, Indonesia, and so on. And of course, it counterparts uh, the, the much earlier one in Africa. We've had, actually, a lot of researchers from uh, Virginia working in Africa but Virginia has a very, very different tradition than, uh, say, the Africanists themselves. Uh, our Africanist was Victor Turner. Hmm. And uh, his work and the work of some of my other colleagues uh, uh, channeled these Africanists in an entirely different direction. Virginia Africanists looked nothing like traditional Africanists. The people they describe, the Africa that they describe, is different. It looks like Levi Strauss. <laughs> it uh, it looks like the Pacific. Uh, one of our uh, one of our most effective um, workers. He worked with some people in Togo called the uh, Cabre, Charles Peel. Totally ingenious guy incorporated these gender insights from Marilyn and Strathern and others, incorporated a number of structural insights and things into his work. And as he put it, you know, kinship among the Cabre is based on feeding people. And if you trace this out and study out the idioms used, it looks like something that comes from Polynesia. It doesn't look like Africa. That's is <coughs> a generic uh, trait or failing or what you will of uh, Virginia Africanists. Our Africa doesn't look like other people's Africa. Okay? It doesn't look like Meyer Fortis's Africa or Evans Pritchard's Africa. Uh, the newer actually looks strikingly like New Guineans in retrospect. And of course this is kind of an ironic uh, contrast. But uh, I, think, uh, I think Evans Pritchard uh, came like maybe closest to this. But, but basically, you've got uh, different eras in anthropology, and you've got different, you know, problem areas and area problems. For a while there, with Sir Edmund Leach, you know, you had the possibility of something uh, with Burma and Southeast Asia. The political systems of Highland Burma was something I taught very much. Um, much later, we had a graduate student, uh, herself Chinese, Kai Tsui Ping, who did about 10 months of field work with the Kachin or Jinpo, as they called them, that live in China that no one had researched before. Uh, this uh, blew the whistle on the whole Gum Sahagum Lao controversy, everything of that sort. Tsui Ping, she came out of the field. I debriefed her. I said, well, what, what do you have now to say about political systems of Highland Burma? Levi Strauss's comments on the Gunsa Gunla. What, 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 what is your opinion on this? She said, it has nothing to do with it. She said, it's all the bamboo on the skirt. It's a matter of what idioms, symbolic idioms they use and how they use this tremendous symbol of the bamboo and the skirt. She said, you can do anything with it. And see, that sounds like Tony Crook once again, and this, this kind of very clever rhetorical art or finesse of creating the illusion of immense secrecy, where no secrecy need exist. And so you think, you know, one thinks we ought to pay some attention to rhetorics, both the type of rhetoric we use to talk about these people and the type of rhetoric they use. You see what I mean? Hmm. You, again, you mentioned several interesting people there. I mean, what it, what is your? Evan Spritchard was my uh, DPhil examiner, and I've always had a enormous respect for him. Me too. Uh, all of the people I've known has have always had an enormous mm. re uh, respect for him. Uh, the newer that that of course that is the 
despite Malinowski, despite everyone else. That is the type case monograph that has dominated anthropology. It's brilliant. Yeah. The things written at the end of the Noor, you know these things that Noor's mind is mostly on his compound, Evans Pritchard's, um, you know, almost disdain for that, that, uh, that telescoping lineage system that he talks about and the politics involved with it. There's something very beautiful in that. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's actually achieved a kind of objectivity in a highly and all too subjective discipline. And uh, rather than try to emulate him, what people have done with his newer work, and of course with his other monographs and stuff like that, is you know what religions do when they get to be a little bit too uh, cloying and close to themselves. They literalize things. They take these beautiful metaphors through which E.P. has, has you know, allowed us to have like a space of thinking about the newer, and then make them, uh, they typecast them, they, 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 they literalize them, they make them into formulae, which is of course one of the problems with structuralism too. It's uh, one wants to have a bit more freedom of thought with those things, and not think they are constrained really into triangles, although my God, I'm guilty of, as guilty of triangles as anyone. I just sort of like them. Three, three is a lucky number, and so on. Mm -hmm. And the the other person you mentioned there, who is my great hero in America, Marshall Salvin. Yeah, it? Marshall. Yeah, Marshall. You probably know is the brother of uh, his brother runs something called Second City in Chicago. Uh, this is a political cabaret. The Salmons mm. family are into uh, comedy. <laughs> now, this is something that's mm. extremely important and mm. powerful. This is the power of humor in anthropology as a humanizing and uh, liberalizing element. Marshall is a master of that. My teacher, David Schneider, was yes. a master of that. David Schneider's best book is called Schneider on Schneider hmm. and consists of like unbelievably droll stories. It's just all humor. Hmm. David accumulated and David taught with these humorous stories. I was he was my, my major professor. He was the supervisor of my, my, my dissertation. He always taught that way. Uh, this was David. David was humor in anthropology. Marshall is like that too. It's an American style. It's almost an American Jewish style. Hmm. Marshall uh, Solon's, t I think Edith Turner told me, and Marshall told her, that he is a direct descendant of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism in Eastern Europe, okay? And the founder, the, the Baal Shem Tov, was considered the village idiot. He was considered, you know, he couldn't debate in the temple on law and these things that a good Ashkenazim Jew would do. Uh, so they made him escort the school children to and from school in this little village. And he made up cute little stories to entertain the kids while he was walking them. And those stories became the basis of Hasid. And there, there, you have David Schneider in that, you have Marshall Solomons, you know, and uh, 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 Marshall is, Marsh, these guys use this, this humorous technique of a storytelling, they use it almost as though they were, they were, they were uh, Hasidim uh, themselves, you see. It, it, it gives a very distinctive flavor to American anthropologists. And, they have educated a lot of us. They're, they're, they're very important people. And that's a very different kind of tradition than, than, than you have in England. I mean, there are people... I like to think uh, Marilyn Strathern has a particularly good sense of humor that she will sometimes exercise, but she's very shy about it. Hmm. Tony Crook, actually, her student, uh, is more forward about his sense of humor that way. And it, it may be something that's emerging in English anthropology now, mm -hmm. but it's, it's been almost a kind of secret of American anthropology. David Schneider had a lot of students. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them were quite successful and so on and so forth. And they were pretty much propelled by this, this, mm -hmm. this, this sort of humorous discourse thing. 
you, you reminded me that David had such an influence on you. He was your PhD supervisor, wasn't yes. he? Yes. Uh, he actually, what had happened is that uh, David, um, David had had a strange career before that. He had been, I think, at Berkeley, where he was only for a few years. Uh, Chicago had just lost Robert Redfield, who was its principal figure in the 1950s. Uh, uh, the Primitive World and its mm. Transformations, uh, his work in Mexico and Chiapas and mm. things like that. Redfield was a, a quite quite a fine scholar and a, and a big figure, actually. And so the question was, what was Chicago to do after Redfield? Uh, one of my teachers, Milton Singer, had, uh, who was actually, he was, uh, had close ties with Cambridge, mm. uh, uh, he was involved, he was sort of carrying the uh, aura of uh, Redfield after uh, after Redfield passed away. And, and I had actually took a lot of coursework with Milton. But, uh, Fred Egan, uh, a, another one of my teachers, uh, Fred uh, basically raided Berkeley and brought um, three people, David Schneider, Clifford Garretts, <coughs> pardon me, Clifford Geertz and uh, Lloyd Fowlers, uh, a, a very staunch Weberian. These people were supposed to be staunch Weberians. And uh, what was that guy now that uh, they were always? Okay. Anyway, uh, Talcott Parsons. Hmm. They were Parsonian anthropologists. Hmm. Schneider described himself as a parsnip. Uh, <laughs> they were supposed to come to Chicago and teach Parsonianism. Okay. I. I was, I think, present in David Schneider's first lecture class. Uh, it was called the Systems class for incoming graduate students, you see, in Chicago. There's a lot of it was humor. <laughs> it was a great deal of it was humor. Uh, we were supposed to read Parsons, and we couldn't get through it. It was, it was this, this sort of horrendous, we thought, kind of eclectic anthropology that was supposed to put um, you know, sort of energetics, economics, uh, social interaction together into some kind of a big totality and, uh, you know, one was supposed to deduce the system from it. And they called these courses the systems courses. 